please join me in welcoming Michael Bergdahl. You know, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up knowing it must outrun the fastest lion or it'll die. Each day a lion wakes up knowing it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it'll starve to death. You know, it really doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you had better be running. And you know, the words that I just recited are on a plaque. And that plaque is in the hallway of the executive area at Walmart's headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas. And you know, when Sam Walton used to walk out of his office each and every day, that plaque was right in front of him as he'd go out to do the business of retailing. So what you think about, you know, when you're out there trying to compete is that Walmart is very aggressive. I'll tell you a story that is uh, kind of the Canadian version of lions and gazelles. I was up at Whistler uh, in British Columbia oh, about two weeks ago. And I spoke at the International Council of Shopping Centers meeting. And this guy runs up to me, he says, I gotta tell you this competitive story, and maybe you can use it in one of your speeches. So he says, uh, he tells me the story about the, uh, the two campers in British Columbia. And these two campers are up on the mountain in, in, in British Columbia, camping overnight. And in the middle of the night, this grizzly bear comes into the camp and it's madder than a hornet. So they get up and they get out of their sleeping bags and the one camper peers out through the, uh, the tent. And he turns around and the other camper is strapping on his tennis shoes. And he says, what are you doing? You can't possibly outrun a grizzly bear. He said, I know I can't outrun a grizzly bear, but I don't have to. I just have to outrun you. And you know, when you, when you think about the competitive world that we live in, and you think about the nature of competition in pharmacy in particular, the key to being successful is like that second camper. You have to be willing to adapt and change in order to be successful. And I know that when I wrote my first book called What I Learned from Sam Walton, How to Compete and Thrive in a Walmart World, I never intended to write a book to begin with. That was not my goal to be an embedded reporter at Walmart in Bentonville and to craft a book as a result of the experience. In fact, I didn't write a book to many years later after I found the teachings were so important. And what was interesting was this. The, uh, the, when, I, when I would uh, go out to do interviews for my book, I would talk to pharmacists, and I talked to convenience store operators, and I talked to grocers, and I asked them, what does it take to compete and thrive in a Walmart world? And I learned many, many valuable lessons that they told me that I put into my book. But what I also found out was that many of Walmart's competitors have gone out of business without a fight. Just the simple announcement that a super center was going to be built in their locale they shuttered their businesses up and went out of business, which is sort of amazing to me. They did it without a fight. And not only is it possible to compete, survive, and thrive in a Walmart world, there's examples of pharmacies that have done it in virtually every town where Walmart has opened a super center. And I want to share some inspirational verses I get started this morning. If you're thinking that the idea of having more of these big box retailers coming into your communities is going to be a, a really difficult thing and, and, and tough competition, I hope you take some inspiration from these words. And it goes like this. If you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win but you think you can't, it's almost a cinch you won't. If you think you'll lose, you've lost. For out in the world we find, success begins with a person's will. It's all in a state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win the prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger woman or man. But sooner or later, he or she who wins is the one who thinks they can. And as a starting point for competition in this brutally competitive pharmacy world that we live in, it begins with the belief in the beginning that you can be successful. Because the reality is, if you think you can compete, you probably can. And if you think you can't compete, you probably can't. In either case, the way that you think at the beginning will determine the outcome. 
and whether you'll be successful or not. And that's one of the things I talk to audiences about around the world. In Istanbul or in Caracas, Venezuela in two weeks from now when I go down to Venezuela or over in Germany or in Spain, I talk about how to compete and thrive in a Walmart world. This morning I'm going to talk about what I call the drugstore and more. And I thought this was an interesting quote to begin the session today because it helps you to understand Walmart's strategy. And the strategy that Walmart has is their priority is North America first, South America, Asia, and then Europe. And if you think in terms of what does that actually mean when you translate the North American strategy, well, you know the second largest market for Walmart in the world after the U.S.? You know what it is, anybody? The market is Mexico. And in Mexico, Walmart has 900 stores in a whole variety of formats in Mexico. And they continue to have opportunities for growth in Mexico. And they continue to have opportunities for growth in the U.S. But you know, when you look at North America, do you know where the real opportunities for growth are? Some really great opportunities for growth are northward in Canada. And I'll show you a couple of interesting statistics to start out our day. Things you just need to know about Walmart, and then I'll talk about Canada in particular. In 2007, Walmart will open more than one store every day of the year somewhere on, on the planet Earth. They have 1.8 million employees. They have 6,600 stores around the world in 14 countries and 120 massive distribution centers. Of, their, uh, of the 6,600 stores, only 20% of sales for Walmart come from international, 80% come from the U.S. And if you think in terms of the fact they're only in 14 countries, the writing's on the wall that their expansion is going to be international. 138 million customers cross their thresholds every week. Their annual sales are in excess of 312 billion, probably 316 billion is a more accurate number. They're the third largest pharmacy chain in the U.S. with $32 billion of sales when you blend pharmacy with OTC with HBC, or HBA as you call it. Uh, interestingly enough, pharmacy only represents the 5% of the Walmart business, the pharmacy sales themselves, which are around $12 billion if you lump in Sam's Club. And it, you, know, you think about that, it's, it's, a, it's a small part of the business, the overall business of the company, but those are big numbers, $12 billion. There's 3,800 pharmacies in the USA in four different formats, and they have approximately 300 Walmart stores in Canada. Here's an interesting question. What does Canada have in common with these four states in America? Anybody know? They both have approximately 33 million people. And I selected these four states in preparation for this meeting to kind of give you a, a, a rough idea of the possibilities with respect to you know, uh, an area of Walmart where they're very well established. Because in these states, they are well established. Do you like to know how many stores they have in those four states across those 33 million people in the US? Anybody? How about this number? They have 634 stores today. And the interesting thing about that number is this, that of those 634 stores, more than two-thirds of them are super centers. And if you take the 300 stores in Canada for Walmart, only 10 of the 300 stores are now super centers. And the reality is the growth of Walmart will be through super centers. And in all of these stores, you know, 634 stores, they have pharmacies. And the likelihood is they will here too. And they'll have the super centers, they'll have the discount stores, they'll have neighborhood markets, and they'll have Sam's Clubs. Along with this, there's also 15 distribution centers in this geography, by the way. So I tell you these statistics because that makes the, the presentation that I'm making today all the more meaningful for you to understand the potential for Canada with the further expansion of Walmart. When Walmart opened its super centers for the first time in 1988, they had a very little market share in groceries. It took them about 12 years to become number one, and they now garner 20% of the grocery sales in the U.S. This past holiday season in toys, they took 45% of the U.S. toy market. 
And what they've done along the way is they've had a, a, uh, made it difficult for groceries to compete in the U.S. 26 regional chains went out of business. Convenience stores, when they introduced gasoline, and all the big boxes introduced gasoline, a full 25% of convenience stores in the U.S. went out of business, and they anticipate another 25% will go out of business over the next 10 years because they rely too much on gasoline for profitability. And on and on and on. They're interested in banking. They have uh, taken a, a major step into getting into banking in the U.S., and they currently have 1,000 lease locations where they have banks in the U.S. And now pharmacies. And this is not a casual interest they're taking in pharmacies, as you'll see in my presentation. I built this presentation today for you. I took a lot of time to, uh, to do a lot of research on pharmacies in particular. I speak to audiences all the time about general Walmart competition, but I, I took it upon myself to really focus what I'm going to talk to you about today. So you're the first audience that's ever seen a lot of this material. And what I do is I build the presentation around an acronym called POCKETS. And whether you are a manufacturer, a supplier, a retailer, in any industry, you have to find a niche within which to operate, which I characterize as a business pocket. And I built my book around this acronym POCKETS, which stands for the seven key strategies of Walmart. Price, operations, culture, key item promotion, and uh, product, expenses, talent, and service. And within those seven areas of the pocket acronym represent the seven key strategies of Walmart. And most of the time what I do is I go through a general presentation where I very specifically talk to audiences about how to compete and thrive in a Walmart world and I really drill down into their strategy. I also talk to companies that supply Walmart. I actually have a, uh, a, a, a link on my website called Venderville. Has anybody ever heard the term Venderville? Venderville is an actual place, and it's in northwest Arkansas. And it's, what's happened over the years is over a 1,000 of the Walmart suppliers have opened offices in northwest Arkansas in the middle of the Ozark Mountains. And what they've done is uh, a company like Procter & Gamble has more than 200 employees fully dedicated to Walmart and Sam's Club operations based in Benton County near the Walmart headquarters. And it's become, it looks like a, a junior St. Louis when you go there. It, there's all these cranes and they're building everywhere. And Sam Walton would be shocked and awed by the amount of growth that's come to the area. But that's called Venderville. And that's how important it is for those customers because almost everybody that supplies Walmart, Walmart is their biggest customer. Any of you suppliers ready to move to Bentonville? <laughs> Trust me, they have some difficulty attracting people down into the Ozark Mountains. And I, for one, I enjoyed my experience down there, and I lived in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. I'm going to walk you through these strategies, and I apologize. I have a limited amount of time and a lot of information to cover, but I'll take you through the, uh, the, the front shop, back shop strategy uh, that I think that Walmart's using. And I'll also talk about some things I think that you can do for your businesses in order to maximize your ability to compete. The first slide says, the realization that all of you have to have to begin with is that service and convenience, which are hallmarks of, of good pharmacy operations to begin with, can trump everyday low prices. And it happens in America all the time. There's neighborhood pharmacies that are on the street in the shadow of super centers, and they compete very effectively. But what they do is they serve their customers, and they create a convenient shopping experience. They know their customers. I'm not going to ask, but if I asked, how many of you think that your, your stores have great customer service? Most of you would raise your hand. Well, the reality is, if we walk into your stores, do you really think that level of service is truly that great? because there's always room for improvement. And I challenge you to believe that you can be successful by serving your customers and leveraging your convenience in the communities where you operate. This is the Sam Walton discounting strategy. Many people uh, don't know the, the, what discounting is all about, but what he figured out in the case of a pharmacy, he would, he'd go out and buy a tube of toothpaste, and he'd buy lots of tubes of toothpaste. And he could buy that tube of toothpaste for, let's say, 80 cents. 
and he'd build the biggest display of toothpaste that you've ever seen. And then he'd go ahead and sell that toothpaste for a dollar rather than a dollar twenty, which is what a lot of his competitors were selling that toothpaste for. And by doing so, he'd make half the profit per item, but because of the low price, he could sell three times as much, and by doing so, he'd make a greater profit overall. And that's the story of discount retailing. And that's how Sam Walton and, and the everyday low price strategy works. And they use the pharmacy today. There's, there's a, an inter, a, a kind of a cute uh, saying that the pharmacy is the new popcorn at Walmart. Because Sam Walton, back in the early days, used to use popcorn to draw people into the store. He'd have free popcorn for the community. And pharmacy is now becoming the, the same as, as that popcorn. It's, it's designed to drive traffic into the store. And one of the things I thought was interesting as I did my research is if you look at dispensing fees for, for pharmaceuticals, and Medicare is, is, uh, is, is really a target of Walmart. They really want the senior citizens in the Walmart pharmacy. Well, the, the Medicare in the U.S. only reimburses at the rate of $4.50 per script. But they figured out that the cost of, of uh, each script is around ten fifty. So you start to sit there and say, well, why would they go after an, a market like that where they, they're, they're absolutely, they got $4 generics in the U.S., and they're, they're going to get reimbursed. How, is this, how does the math work? It doesn't seem to work based on Walmart. But what are they looking for? They're looking for traffic because they're gonna, they want to reinforce one-stop shop, shopping in their stores and drive more customers to the store. Walmart has private label products. And it, with their private label products, it's rumored that Walmart is going to start to become a distributor of groceries in, in some geographies where they don't have the, the scale to put stores. So they're actually going to supply other grocers and other convenience stores and other pharmacies out of their own distribution centers. And Walmart has private label products, and when you walk their stores, they have private label products in the pharmacy. And interestingly enough, the, the private label products in the Walmart pharmacy are designed to keep the big brands honest. Because what they do is they offer very similar formulations of products to what you'll find for like Sudafed. There's an Equate product that's very similar to Sudafed. Well, in fact, it's, it's the same as Sudafed, and, but at a much lower price. They do the same thing on the grocery side. They do the same thing with, with Procter & Gamble. With Tide, they have a formulation that's a Walmart formulation, a private label. But they're really building their private label business. I think some of those learnings on private label came out of Europe because the Europeans are more adaptive to private label products than the U.S. is, and, and probably for the same matter, Canada. And so private label is a, big, is a big opportunity for Walmart. And then they use all of this to drive their everyday low price strategy of one-stop shopping. They want those seniors to come into the store. They want those seniors to get a, a shopping cart and walk around the store and shop. Your front shop, back shop strategy. I'd recommend to you that you, you, you do, on a local level, shopping cart comparisons every week. You know, go up into the front shop, go to the back shop, uh, you know, OTC, uh, health and beauty aids. Go into the, into the general merchandise area of your competitors and shop the stores. Because I'll tell you who also does shopping cart comparisons. It's Walmart. They send their people out regularly to shop your stores. And what they do is they'll actually come in and they buy merchandise from your store and they bring it back to their store and you know what they do, they run it through their scanners and they check the prices and they make sure the bottom line on all those products that they bought at your store are cheaper in their store. They don't just shop one of your stores, they shop stores across Canada because the pricing strategy for Walmart isn't the same in every store across all of Canada. It's based on a number of factors including demographics and competitive nature of that market and they adjust the prices accordingly. But you should be doing shopping cart comparisons also. You can't use one size fits all pricing strategies. You know, some kind of a, of a percentage markup on all products. You have to, the, the consumer is too sophisticated today and they're too well educated to understand pricing that you have to be price competitive and razor sharp on all of your products. And that's why it's important to do the shopping cart comparisons. And the other thing that Walmart does is they have uh, focus groups of pharmacy customers that they bring in and talk to. 
because they, they really believe in taking input from their, from their customers and also from their own employees. So here's some ideas for you that you can use on price. The most important probably is this. Just remember that if you are not a discounter, don't try to act like a discounter. And I can't tell you how many times I've, uh, I've run into examples of retailers who have tried to replicate the Walmart model. And, and you know why they can't do it. Because most companies don't have the economies of scale to be able to have that same kind of, of everyday low price strategy that Walmart has. So if you're not a discounter, don't try to act like a discounter. Focus on service, fo focus on convenience, Make sure that your prices are, are, are reasonable within reason of, that, of the market. You don't have to be the lowest. Not everybody's looking for the lowest price. But just be aware of the fact, don't try to be a discounter if you're not one. On to operations. The thing that is really surprising when people uh, enter a Walmart store and they see that greeter standing there, you know the person I'm talking about? They hire the same, uh, from the same family, I think, all over the country. They have the, the greeters, right? So you walk in the door. Do you know this greeter? Is, uh, isn't that a great example of customer service? I always wonder why pharmacies don't do that. Because you've got someone sitting behind the register, and a lot of times the traffic is slow in the store. Why doesn't the person come out and greet people that are coming in? No brainer to me. And then do suggestive selling and, and uh, really create a friendly atmosphere. Well, did you know that Walmart is one of the highest tech companies that you'll ever want to see? You wouldn't know that when you walk in the front door of a Walmart store and, and you see the, the person that's standing there that's greeting you. Person's not a greeter, by the way. Okay, that's what they call them. That person is a shrink control specialist. And their job is to control shrinkage of a product going out that door. Retail theft. Because I'll tell you what, try this experiment. Next time you walk into a Walmart store, carry a bag in. And that person will run you down and tackle you in, before you can get halfway into the store. Because that's their job, to secure the merchandise. And that's what the greeter does at Walmart. But they're a greeter. And I went through, and I, you know, as you think about Walmart, Walmart is not a merchandise-driven company. Unlike everybody else who's, who is merchandise-driven, Walmart is logistics and distribution-driven, and products in the Walmart stores are commodities. And what they do that it is so successful and so hard for competitors to compete with is they use technology as, as a, as a, as a, and use the scale of technology as a strength. They cross-dock in their warehouses. Walmart doesn't have warehouses, typically. Now, they have warehouses in pharmacy because of the quantities uh, and because of the, the chain of custody issues that they have with pharmaceuticals. But in the general merchandise of Walmart, they don't have warehouses. And what they do is everything comes in off trucks from suppliers and flows through the distribution centers on one side and goes on trucks on the other side immediately. And the goal from the time that Walmart receives merchandise is to have that merchandise in the trunks of customers' cars within 72 hours of receiving the merchandise. That's a goal. That's a good goal to have. Unless you're pay per scan, and if you're pay per scan, it's your problem. It's your inventory that you have in that store. If you're one of the card shops, anybody who's a card shop here that sells cards to uh, retailers, pay per scan. They, they want you to carry your own inventory and your own shrinkage. Technology. A lot of people don't know this, but Walmart has the second largest IT system in the world, second only to the Pentagon in, in Washington, D.C. That's how high tech the, the company is, and which is, which is an amazing statistic. And last, this is the, uh, the, the, one of the real driving forces behind the company, no pun intended, the fleet. The fleet is non-union, and it is also uh, it's a spoken hub distribution system. And the way that Walmart grew and the way it will grow in Canada is through spoken hub. And spoken hub is this. They build a distribution center first, and then they locate stores one day tractor trailer ride out to a store and back to a distribution center and they, they radiate out from a distribution center using that strategy and that was Sam Walton's original strategy for Walmart was a distribution strategy spoken hub and then if you think about it they have this this tremendous market then for that distribution center and allows them the opportunity to fill in with new formats they can put in a neighborhood market they could put in if they wanted to they could go into the convenience store business which I think they will 
They could go into standalone pharmacies, which I think they will, because I thought they were going to acquire Eckerd's in that recent, uh, all, the, all that activity around Eckerd's in the U.S., I thought that Walmart was in the fray, and I thought they might acquire standalone stores with Eckerd's. And they use this distribution center, and the more merchandise they can flow through the, through the distribution center, the more they can lower their costs. Technology. I was a little shocked and awed when I pulled this together for your presentation of how many different technologies are tied to the pharmacy in Walmart. They have this Connexus system, which is just workflow of, of, the, of the actual scripts. They have the interactive RX network, which allows a customer who lives in, in Vancouver to fill a, fill a script when they're visiting in Toronto at a Walmart pharmacy. They have automated replenishment which allows them to, they, they don't, uh, they have vendor partnerships. That's one of the, the famous uh, relationships that Sam built years ago with suppliers. They call them vendor partnerships. And all of the Walmart technology is shared with all the suppliers. And so when reordering time comes, there, there is no discussion, there's no paper flow, there's, there's automated replenishment. A report goes back to Procter & Gamble and they load the trucks up and they bring, bring the product to the distribution center and it's flowing constantly. Walmart's a big driver of RFID. In, in the pharmacy area, the only area that's really uh, where they're maximizing RFID for, for, uh, for, for the, in the pharmacy itself is controlled substances are now all on RFID and they have a chain of custody and they receive shipments at every pharmacy in, the, in, in their system once a week. They receive five shipments a week from their, uh, from their warehouses, because they do have warehouses for some of their the smaller quantity items that they bring in, five times a week. And all of that uh, product is flowing using automated replenishment and, and, and then the RFID. And RFID is at a case level and a pallet level at Walmart. And they actually, they would, they'd love to probably get it to the, to the bottle level in the pharmacy, because we all know that that is, you know, the, the technology is there to do that, and if it can be done, it will be. I spoke to some people from the pharmacy group at Walmart uh, it, just within the time that I knew I was coming here. And this, this uh, a pharmacist said, he said, you've got to see what's coming down the pipeline in pharmacy. And I said, yeah. He said, but I can't tell you. He said, I can't tell you. He said, what we've done up to this point is going to knock your socks off. They have a new strategy coming. I said, is it RFID? He said, can't tell you. I said, are you going with standalone pharmacies? He said, I can't tell you. But there's something coming, a new, the new wave for the pharmacy, and I don't know what it is, but there's something else coming. They have live satellite broadcasts that go into their pharmacies, and they actually do live events with their pharmacists once a month for two hours on live satellite, and it's interactive so that the pharmacists can call in and ask questions. They have the easy pay credit card system, interactive voice response, the Internet Pharmacy website, and this one I thought was really interesting from a, from a manufacturer supplier's perspective, they have display TV. And historically, Walmart had broadcast TV in its stores. So when you walked in, you saw Walmart TV, and in, in every department, you'd see the same thing on the screens, unless they had a VCR hooked up. And they've now come out with a replacing broadcast TV with this new concept, which is, which is a, an Internet protocol which allows the suppliers to put uh, flat screen TVs on end caps and to display uh, their products and actually put infomercials that are, are, uh, are, are fixture specific using this internet protocol. And I thought that was interesting. Display TV is what they call it. My point is, if you look at the technology that's at the disposal of the pharmacist, you can see a tremendous investment in technology. And we'll talk about the, why would you do that? But look at all that. And, and, and much of it is designed around customer convenience. I know most of you, I've done, done some reading on, uh, on, on pharmacies in Canada, and technology obviously has been a major focus for you for quite a long time. But technology is really going to determine convenience when it comes to pharmacy on the go forward. Operationally, I'd like you to teach your employees the, the Walmart acronym HECATI. And Hecate is a pseudo-American Indian word. It's a politically incorrect word because they use an Indian dance and a, and a uh, uh, 
you know, this kind of a, a thing, and they also have a drum beat that's an American Indian drum beat, so they don't do it anymore. But when I was there, they still did it. And Hecate stands for high expectations are the key to everything. And operationally at Walmart, high expectations are the key to everything they do. The thing that Walmart is known for across its system is superior execution. And some of the manufacturers here told me stories of where they work with Walmart, and when they go to roll something out to the Walmart stores, they execute. They don't sit around grousing about it or asking questions about why are we doing this, they execute. And I want you to take that message and think about it, because in your own stores, Walmart's people are, are almost like a, like a military of the way they execute. Because you know what? They know if Walmart makes a mistake with a strategy, and, and the word bubbles up that it's not quite what we need, they'll change it. And they're confident in their leadership that they'll change the strategy. But change is a, is a friend that Walmart leaders embrace. Change is a friend at Walmart. And what I'd, I'd suggest you do is go out and do what Walmart does. Learn from your suppliers. Learn from the companies around you. Walmart benchmarks its best practices against General Electric, Procter & Gamble, uh, Disney, McDonnell Douglas, McDonald's hamburgers. Uh, they don't necessarily benchmark their best practices against other retailers, although they do that too. You should be benchmarking your best practices against your competitors. And this forum, CACDS, this is one of the great reasons that organizations like this exist. I must have heard, I don't know how many times, network, network, network. And what does that mean? Share best practices. And in communities where your pharmacies are located, get your pharmacist to be part of that local chamber or rotary club and share information. You know, much of what we do in retailing at, at, the, at the floor level isn't that proprietary, but we still act like it is. And Main Street merchants are some of the worst at sharing information. Everything's close to the vest. Well, let me tell you this. If I told you the sales for a Walmart store over on a, in a certain location in Toronto, what are you going to do about it? If I, gave you the, if I gave you the numbers. Now, if I told you they were driving a specific product that was out of sight, that would help you. But generally speaking, what are you going to do with that information? And that's why you should share information with your employees, share information with your vendor partners operationally, and, and, and really work with your community to help everybody at, on the retail in your shopping center or on your main street to compete. And that's what Walmart does. On to culture. Sam Walton had a saying, if you take care of your people, your people will take care of the customer and the business will take care of itself. Said another way, employee attitudes affect customer attitudes which will affect your business performance. Sam Walton was fanatical about all of these areas, prices, technology, service, expenses, and people, and he drove that into the organization. And Sam Walton was a consummate entrepreneur. He loved his business. He loved the business of retailing. But he's fanatical about all those areas, and they're fanatical about those areas today. They just started a Sam's Dream campaign in the U.S. where they're talking about Sam Walton's goals and objectives. When you go to their websites, you would think Sam Walton was still alive because all of his coaching is still on the websites around the world and he's become like an iconic figure within the Walmart culture. My point is, if you want to understand Walmart, understand the teachings of Sam Walton. Walmart refers to its employees as associates or business partners. They refer to their customers as neighbors or friends. Of course, in the pharmacy, they're patients. Their managers are coaches. And the people that supply their stores are vendor partners. And, you know, you think, well, these are, these, this is clever. This is clever to call all these different people different names. But that's, don't look at it that way. This is a reality. If you're a vendor partner of Walmart, you understand that that relationship with Walmart is different than it is with many of the other companies that you supply. They have this relationship with their employees as associates, as business partners, and it's one of the things that drove, drove the company, and they drove it using profit sharing. And I'm not going to go into all those details, and I, and I hope we get some nice questions this afternoon at the panel discussion about Walmart and, and some of its people practices, but I'd be happy to, to address some of those things. But this is how Walmart has designed its culture of service, front shop and back shop. What can you do? 
remember this, that team success is more important than individual success, especially in a retailing business. You've got to have, have team players working in your stores. You have to teach everyone to embrace change. And to, as, as you're trying to attempt new initiatives in your business, you have to have all of your employees on board. You can't have half of them on board. You've got to have everybody on board. Set aggressive goals for your organization. Set your goals higher than you think people can achieve, and you'll be surprised. If they're involved in giving you input to those goals, you can achieve more in your business than you ever thought possible. You've got to get the army of people behind your initiatives. And this is an interesting uh, uh, point. Sam Walton had 10 rules for business success. And that's my second book, The 10 Rules of Sam Walton. Six of his rules were about how to treat people. If I stretch my, my memory, one was about controlling your expenses. One was about uh, being passionate about your business. One was about swimming upstream. And one was about serving your customers. But the other six were all about the treatment of the people in your organization. And I truly believe that Walmart is going back and embracing the 10 rules of Sam Walton on the go forward because of a lot of things that have happened in the news media. And interestingly enough, Rob Walton, the son of, I can't call him son of Sam, can I? That doesn't, <laughs> Sam Walton's son, Rob Walton, wrote the foreword for my book, the second book that just came out. And that's, so if you want to learn about the best practices of Walmart, there they are. Key item promotion. Listen to your customers. Go outside in to get product ideas. What, what Sam Walton taught and what the Walmart people do is they go out and talk to their customers and ask the customers what they want and then they buy to meet their needs. The belief at Walmart and why, why the pharmacy has become the new popcorn is because they believe that the pharmacist patient interchange drives the traffic in the store. And what they've done with everything that they do, all the technology that you just saw up there, is to free up the time of the pharmacist. And you know what pharmacists like to do better than anything? They like to fill scripts and count pills. And you know, the thing that Walmart doesn't want them to do is count pills and fill scripts. They want them to sign off on the scripts. And what they do is they are trying to do everything they can to free up the pharmacist to talk to the patients and talk to the customers out on the floor. What does Walmart do? They cross market with their over-the-counter products, health and beauty care. They sell fitness equipment through, the inter through that interchange with the pharmacist, sneakers and workout outfits, and even healthy food. They put on you know, in-store events where they actually have uh, the, the suppliers to Walmart uh, preparing healthy choice foods. And they put those healthy choice foods around the store and so they really view the pharmacy as at the center of the activity of customer traffic going forward. What you have to do is you have to learn from that and you have to turn your store into a destination for health and fitness, which is what their goal is in wellness. Form vendor partnerships and get your vendor partners to run in-store events in your stores so that you're the uh, store of choice for your community for every, all the news involving health and wellness in that community. Go out and talk to your customers. The thing that I always remember about Sam Walton is he loved to go out and talk to customers in the stores. And I mean, he really did it. And he would ask them their ideas. As he saw someone handling some product, he'd go over and talk to them and say, you know, how does that fit your needs? And what, what, are, what, are, what are you looking for at Walmart that you don't currently see? And shop your competitors for new product ideas. The Walmart people shop constantly. They're in your stores looking at your merchandise, looking at your end caps, trying to pick up product ideas. Sam had a belief that innovation is great, you know, terrific to be innovative. Innovation costs a lot more than imitation. And, a, and the best ideas you're ever going to find in retail are out there because what industry is more transparent than retailing because you can walk right into your competitor stores and see their merchandising. You can see their visual merchandising. You can see their promotions. You can see their circulars. You, you know their strategy. And on to expenses. The philosophy at Walmart is every time we spend a dollar foolish, we, foolishly, we take it out of our customers' pockets. Being cheap is actually chic at Walmart. They love it if you tell them they're cheap, because they are. 
and they're cheap right from the top all the way down to the bottom of the organization. And some of you are probably sitting there saying, I wish I could get my people to think that way to, on expenses to be cheap at what they do. Sam's everyday low price strategy is as much driven by his ability to buy products at such, in such large quantities, creating scale, but also from his ability to control his expenses better than anybody else. And his distribution strategy is designed to lower costs. His, uh, his no warehousing strategy is designed to have no costs. His pay per scan strategy is designed to not carry your inventory in his store. You carry it, and that lowers their costs. So it's a double whammy for competitors. They have a tremendous expense control, and they have the clout to buy. And then what they do is, the interesting thing is, they don't drop those dollars to the bottom line. Because the net income of Walmart last year was only 3.5%. On $316 billion of sales, they only made 3.5%. Well, don't feel sorry for them, because that's $12 billion. In, in real terms, that's real money, $12 billion US. But it's only 3.5%. And the way that they do that is they keep on putting pressure to the bottom. They're trying to see how little they can get for every, everything they sell. While everybody else is trying to see how much they can get, Sam Walton was trying to see how little he could get for each item. Walmart has centralized expense control, the centralized temperature control, where all of the, the heating and air conditioning in all the stores is controlled centrally through technology out of Bentonville. Executive travel, they stay at quality inns and they stay at the low budget hotels. They sleep two to a room, executives, and everybody in the company. And uh, they fly on, in coach seats wherever they fly, including Sam Walton when he was alive. And it's, it's funny to see that. And I remember the first time I was on the road with Walmart and I'm staying with somebody at a quality inn and we're fighting to get to the phone to see who could get to the phone first in the room. And it's a, it's a very different way to, to travel. And then their overtime and their budgets. When I first went to Walmart, I asked my, uh, I, I needed to add some staff because we were increasing at a very rapid rate adding stores. I went to my boss and I said, uh, I need to, uh, to you know, look at adding some staff and I also need to know what, how do I budget for overtime? What's the typical rule of thumb for overtime? And yeah, someone said, it. he gave me the old goose egg, zero. The budget for overtime is, is zero. And so what, what we got very good at was, was maximizing the productivity of the straight time hours of all of our employees. Because Sam Walton figured that when you go into an overtime situation, you just increased your labor cost by 50%, and he wasn't going to do that. So what he did is that if, if you had overtime, which people do, it was a management problem. And they start looking at the manager as, as far as how they were scheduling people. What can you do in expenses? Adjust your schedules to fluctuate with the sales volume. Avoid scheduled overtime. In, in many businesses, overtime is an entitlement. And if you try to take it away from your employees, you're going to have a, a lot of uh, a pain to deal with because it's an entitlement to the employees. But to be competitive, you're, you, at best, you better be paying straight time hours and not overtime hours. Recycle everything and teach everybody in your organization to recycle. At Walmart, we used to use the back side of every sheet of paper. So if we got a note from somebody in writing, we put an X through this side and put it in a tray, and when we were ready to print something, we ran it through our printer with an X on the back. And theoretically, if you do that, you lower your paper cost by 50%. Now, if you had 1.8 million employees all doing that, you could save a lot of paper today. And that's what they do at Walmart. Go back and try to implement that simple strategy in your business and talk to your employees about it and see what they say. And you'll find out how adaptive your people are to change. Focus your staff on shrinkage control. Bring that cashier out to be a greeter and let them, let them greet people and watch for, uh, for, for retail theft. And offer your employees an incentive for controlling expenses, whatever your expense goals are, but offer them an incentive. And finally, talent. Well, I also have service. The people, you know, the, the strategy at Walmart centers around empowering everyone to serve the customer. And what that means in the pharmacy is driving the decision-making down to the technicians and other employees of the pharmacy. 
the technicians in the pharmacy fill the scripts. They count the pills and they get the sign off from the pharmacist where they legally can do that. And they, they push decision making down, allowing the pharmacist to talk to patients. Sam Walton hired off the farms and he had a strategy called picking them green. He used to promote people in the organization before they were ready. He called it picking them green because they have so many opportunities, he would move people up before they, they were even ready for the next role. I'd been with PepsiCo, the Frito-Lay division, and we wouldn't put somebody into a job unless they had five to seven years of prerequisite experience and sparks coming out there, you know what. And you know, a lot of companies, if you don't have prerequisite experience, you don't get the job. At Walmart, they just move people up. And I'm here to tell you that nine out of 10 times, it worked. And it blew me away. It blew away a lot of my beliefs that I learned at PepsiCo about staffing when I saw how Walmart did it. One of the reasons I wrote books. And Sam Walton taught everybody in the company to think like a merchant. He taught me to think like a merchant. And I'd go to product meetings on Saturday morning and have buyers presenting merchandise. And I understood the stores and I understood the product in the stores. And so did the top 500 leaders of the company. Didn't matter whether they were in accounting, human resources, advertising, real estate. They were there and they learned about the business. And every Saturday morning to this day, the top 500 executives of Walmart are sitting in a conference room in Bentonville, Arkansas at 7 o'clock central time every Saturday from 7 until at least noon, plotting strategies in order to compete more effectively. I used to say they were in there plotting their strategies while the Kmart guys were out there lining up golf balls on the first tee at the golf course. And that's what you're up against, but they teach everybody to think like a merchant. When you're out there, hire people for attitude and teach them the skills. You know, you're, you're better off finding someone who's got good customer service skills and just teach them your business. Give people more responsibility and authority earlier than you think they're ready for it, and rarely will they let you down. And I'm sure that this challenges the way a lot of you are thinking. You're going, well, so-and-so, he's just not there yet for this promotion. Give it to him. Give him a try. Nine out of ten times it'll work. Deal with those who aren't performing. Walmart is not uh, shy about dealing with non-performers and they deal with them squarely in order to give the good people a reason to do a good job. And promote from within. You know, the key to your culture is to promote people from within that already know your culture and who can proliferate your culture on the go forward. And teach and reward good service. Go back and shop your stores. And I even say that here. You know, shop your stores and go out for the first time as if you've never been in there before and see what your stores look like from, and see what kind of service you receive if you walk in and no one knows who you are. Adopt a strategy that every day is draft day. You know, if you don't have openings, recruit anyhow and have back pocket candidates because that's what Walmart does. Hire people with good attitudes. Deal with your non-performers and get the pharmacist to delegate to the people around them. And they'll give you 50 reasons why they can't delegate to the people around them. But he who is going to win the kind of the battle for the, for the uh, customer, uh, the carts and minds of customers going forward, is the pharmacy that has the pharmacist talking to the patients. And when you're counting pills and filling scripts, that is not going to allow you to cross mark at the front shop and the back shop. And that's the key to your business is, is the pharmacist counseling patients. And finally, shop your stores. Remember that your customer is the boss, and this is what Sam Walton lived by. He said that if, if the, uh, the customer votes with his feet, and if uh, you don't supply them with the right service that they're looking for, they'll go elsewhere to get it, and, and they can fire everybody in the organization by doing so. Here's some of the things they do with service in their Walmart stores today. They have a new ad campaign, and Walmart doesn't spend money on advertising easily, but they have a focused pharmacy advertising campaign called Prescription for Your Life. They have a community outreach program where they're going out into the community with events and with, with donation type activities and health events in, in the schools and in the community. You've heard they're putting in these new clinics. They currently have about 50 as of February of this year. They'll have 200 by the end of this year and probably 2,000 in two years. 
These in-store clinics are designed for non-emergency care. And guess where those scripts go that that nurse practitioner writes? They go right over electronically to the Walmart pharmacy if the customer will allow that to happen. And they have a whole new super center design that I could go off on, but I won't. But it's going to be on the grocery side of the store, in the front of the store, with a lower profile so the pharmacist can see the patients and the customers while they're in the pharmacy. And it's designed to connect the grocery area with the pharmacy, and it's all designed for cross-marketing. And the word that I heard, it's designed for convenience. When did you ever hear a super center being associated with the word convenience? That's what they're doing with their pharmacies, and they're making it part of their convenience strategy. And their goal is to be the community pharmacist for that community where they're operating. Your strategy, teach your employees to approach and greet every customer. And, and, and this is the ball game. You know, if your employees are stocking shelves, or like in a lot of places, as soon as they see a customer, they're headed in the other direction, and, and Walmart too, they're supposed to approach the customers, and whether they do or not, I don't know. But teach your employees add-on selling, cross-marketing techniques. Uh, there, are, there are specific training programs called FAB, which is Features, Advantage, and Benefits, and SELL, which is another acronym. But you should be teaching those retail selling skills clinics for your employees in your pharmacies. But also, you know who can use those seminars? Are the pharmacists. They also need to know about how to cross-market and sell products. And teach your employees to drop everything else for the customer. That's what they do at Walmart. You know, I wish we had more time. We talked about, you know, uh, price, operations, culture, key item promotion, expenses, talent, and service. Leverage your strengths. Your strengths are being a member of the community, your knowledge of the people in the community, your knowledge of Canada, uh, your ability to provide great service, one-on-one -on -one service, convenience, compounding, which Walmart doesn't do, uh, drive-in windows, delivery, all of these different services are an advantage that you can have in your pharmacies and you need to leverage each and every one of them in order to win. I want to close with a, with a quick inspirational story that will help you as you go away today when you're thinking about you know, the difficulties of competing and thriving in a Walmart world. And I'll tell you the story of how I finally did write my book ten years after I left Walmart. Ten years. My wife, Cheryl, had a stroke in 2003. She was 48 years old and she had a stroke and she's paralyzed on the right side of her body. And she's okay today, but she's still paralyzed. And when she was in the hospital after she'd had the stroke, and she was in a coma for a week. And when she came out of the coma, I walked in and I said, what are we going to do now? I said, you know, this is a new situation that we've never experienced and we have two children. And I'm going to become Mr. Mom here. And she said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. From 8 to 5, Monday through Sunday, seven days a week for the next two months, I'm going to be in physical therapy to learn how to walk again. And she said, what I want you to do is I want you to go home, and I want you to be there with the kids and work out of a home office, and I want you to write that book you've always talked about. And at a time in my life when I shouldn't have had any focus, when I had a right to not have the ability to do something like that, I listened to her and I went home and I sat down at my computer and I started to write. And six months later I wrote the book, What I Learned from Sam Walton, How to Compete and Thrive in a Walmart World. And I have to tell you that I wasn't smart enough to write that book. I had divine intervention, I swear to you, to come up with the POCKETS acronym and that's what the book is designed around. And I'll close with these inspirational words as you're thinking about the difficulties you face in your life and the obstacles that you have to overcome in your business. And believe me, success is failure turned inside out. And it goes like this. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the path you're walking seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile but you seem to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life seems strange with its twists and turns, yet every one of us eventually learns that many a failure would turn about, and we could have won had we stuck it out. Don't give up, though your pace seems slow. You might succeed with just one more blow. 
Often the goal is much nearer than it might seem to the faltering woman or man. You see, often the victor has given up when they might have captured the winner's cup, to later learn as the night slips down how close they were to the winner's crown. Success is failure turned inside out. It's the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when you're the hardest hit. It's when things seem the worst that you mustn't quit. Thank you very much.